Yes, and now I am in the um, somewhat ambiguous um, situation of introducing Irit Rogov. Why ambiguous? Because Irit Rogov is one of the speakers that, of course, do not have to be introduced, yeah, but I uh, still have to do it um, for the sake of protocol. Um, Irit Rogov is probably one of the most world's most renowned theorists and analysts in the field of institutional analysis, in the institutional discussion of art production and education. She has been the founder of the Department of Visual Culture at Goldsmiths College in London, already in 2002, where she holds a professorship for visual culture studies. Irit Rogov has been a decisive protagonist in the discussions around the so-called educational turn, a discussion that of course also sheds light on the question to which extent art schools can or cannot be seen as potential spaces for knowledge production. Her book publications include Museum Culture, Histories, Discourses, Spectacles, then The Divided Heritage, Themes and Problems in German Modernism, Terra Infirma, Geographies, Visual Culture, the edited volumes ACADEMY, which spells Academy, Visual Culture as Seriousness, and of course, a great amount of article contributions to contemporary art writing. Today, Irit Rogov will help us to understand the epistemological conditions of the way we work now, which is also the title of a forthcoming book publication, if I understand correctly. Please welcome Professor Irit Rogov with me. Yeah, of course. Thanks. Can I shut the computer so I can put my papers on it? We have to, we have to put it aside. Okay, yeah. just do it like that. Is it okay? Okay, thanks. Hello. Uh, thank you for this nice introduction and for the invitation to come and join you in the discussion of potential spaces. I'm afraid I have no emancipatory manifestos to hand. I have a lot of torturous reflections on the kind of internal dualism of the condition of knowledge production that we find ourselves in between um, academic institutions of learning um, and various, let's say, quasi proto-art world conditions of production. And uh, I'm interested in the tension between those, but I also recognize that each one of the drives uh, under whose aegis we're operating has a kind of contradictory duality. And that part of the way we work now is to plot out those kind of contradictory dualities in which we find ourselves. So, the, the, for example, one, one of the things that seems to me very significant is the fact that there is, in, in universities and, and in art academies, uh, there's a tremendous drive to move out of the institution, so to take the, the knowledge that gets produced and to put it to the test of all kinds of different conditions, um, all kinds of, 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 of uh, different, different environments, uh, different political demands, etc. At the same time, all institutions, be they uh, universities, art academies, museums, uh, etc., equally put, put um, forward and, and privilege the notion of a certain kind of exteriority, but in a very sort of different way around questions of enterprise and partnership and the ability to get hold of resources that are not naturally allocated to, to the scene of education. And so we have a, a kind of situation where the drive to move outwards is subject to two sets of quite contradictory demands. And we have to work with both of these. And so everything to do with um, sort of, of what I am calling the way we work now, which is a pun on a 19th century novel by Trollope, which uh, is called The Way We Live Now, which has to do with the arrival of the nouveau riche 
into the, the sort of aristocratic scene of ruling um, England in, in the 19th century, that everything that has to do with the way we work now is kind of, of coded with a certain kind of contradictory duality. And that if one is working in late capitalism, neoliberal managerialism, institutions uh, of education um, that are conceived or perceived as uh, revenue streams, trying to um, sort of, of, of produce an illusion that education is a mode of training for employment for students who then uh, have to pay enormous amounts of fees and then face a market that actually has no uh, employment uh, for them. These, these are the kind of conditions, so of course coming from Britain, um, this is a, a, a more acute condition than uh, perhaps elsewhere, but um, my, my, maybe now that Britain is leaving the EU, uh, this is not going to be the case, but my, my sense has always been that where Britain goes five years later, the rest of Western Europe follows. And so I think that the sort of extreme conditions of neoliberal managerialism of education and research um, is something that everyone has to pay attention to because in a way it's a writing on the wall. Um, so, thinking about advanced research practices, um, I'm thinking of them at the intersection of several pressures. One is institutions in search of expansion. And expansion, by expansion I mean, you know, various expansions. Spheres of influence, the ability to, to capture resources, um, the, the ability to function uh, beyond one's locale, the ability to function beyond one's, one's sort of, of perceived notion of, of um, what academic research might be, as opposed to market-driven research, etc. Um, equally, attempts to uh, make the, the world of art, um, the world of education, be about more than art and more than education. And I think that that for me is something very important because these are the sort of, of possibilities by which one can kind of, of, of continually re-singularize, re-politicize certain spheres which have always been kind of, of, of um, seen as more sheltered. And so the, the, the notion of thinking about education and um, artistic production as the sites of certain kind of social organizing, certain kind of, of counter-institutionalism, certain forms of, of uh, I'm reluctant to use the word, word activism, but certain kinds of, of, of active organization and so on, um, is, is really what um, what sort of, of work within the art world, um, such as the work of our collective free thought, which I will mention it towards the end, uh, and which is largely about what does it mean to engage in public study, what does it mean to engage in public research, that that is part of what um, I'm thinking about in thinking about the, the, the sort of the worlds of education and the worlds of art being more than, than what they are. Um, an emphasis on process rather than product um, and ways of not being captive by the market. And again, I, I'm speaking from London, which are the conditions under which I work, but I think that they are increasingly uh, familiar conditions, which is that there's almost nowhere uh, that, that operates outside of the market. So the ability to transform certain kinds of spaces into spaces that are spe not spaces of withdrawal, not spaces of exit, but spaces that consciously mobilize to work in the same sphere but counter to market forces is extremely important. Now, uh, very specifically, I'm interested in um, what we're calling practice-based um, 
research, uh, which is a very broad term. And I'm interested in the fact that this is not um, this is not exclusive to the art world, that we have practice-based research across the board of knowledge production and that it is an absolute sea change uh, in terms of how we think about new knowledge, right? So the, the sort of, of new knowledge, which is not a reproductive activity, um, is not an activity of an expansion of something existing, but is conceptualized as a series of encounters encounters between knowledges, encounters between actors, encounters between forms of, of, of social organization, and uh, encounters of these forces with needs, right? So the, the sort of, of notion of needs, not as understood institutionally by who needs what degree in order to enter what field of employment, um, or what kind of, of, of work might, draw uh, an academic space closer to um, an industrial space or space of other kind of production, but needs in terms of what it is uh, to, to organize um, at this particular moment. And recognizing that researching, performing, delivering, displaying, and viewing come with a specific set of problems, right? So not, sp the, not the kind of problems that institutions will articulate for us, that it needs to be communicative, it needs to be legible, it needs to be accessible. All of the stuff that, that by which in institutions judge um, the, their sort of, of, of notions of communication, but that it needs in Deleuzean terms to actualize. Right, so the, the sort of, of, of the work of research being done in public through a public interface has to operate as a mode of actualization rather than as a mode of accessible communication. Now, um, the, the sort of, of the, the project that uh, I'm going to show you towards the end is one that um, I think has also faced me particularly with a series of issues that I hadn't, I don't, I don't think I was aware of before, and that of course is the immense joy of actually having a practice, is that you know you kind of, of work with a set of concepts and then being put to the test, you realize that actually they're not the problem, something else is the problem that you hadn't been able to kind of think of. And that is that um, we have a great deal of knowledge about different modes of research. Um, and we have quite a bit of knowledge now about the possibilities of displaying research. What we have absolutely no knowledge of is what it means to view research. So we set up the, the sort of, 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 of the public interface of research as if it was the public interface of anything else. And of course it's not. It makes completely different demands. And so one, one of the things that I'm, I'm sort of thinking about curatorially is not how to put objects on display, not how to create kind of, of, of um, different kinds of spectacle, but as a kind of laboratory that begins to make it clear what we're not able to think. And in this case, what we're not able to think is what does it mean to be a viewer of research? And so that's, that's sort of, of, of part of, of um, this thinking. Now, I want to, because this is an extensive body of work, I have um, half an hour, so I'm not going to kind of take you through the whole thing, but I want to, think about um, two or three concepts. And the first of these is um, an absolutely fundamental shift, I think, uh, from of working from inherited knowledges, which is how sort of, of intellectual work had proceeded uh, for, for um, several hundred years. So there is a body of knowledge that you inherit and on which, which you expand, you provoke, uh, you contest, you, you improve, etc. But the, the arena for all of that is 
the, the sort of the link to inherited knowledges in one way or another. Contestation is equally, probably even more of a link to inherited knowledges than um, their, their sort of continuity. So the shift in working from inherited knowledge to working from conditions. And that for me is the most fundamental shift that has taken place in what we're calling advanced practices of knowledge right now, right? Practice-based research, if you like. Um, I prefer the notion of creative practices of knowledge or advanced practices of knowledge. The, the, now, it's really important to emphasize that when I'm talking about working from conditions, I'm not talking about working on those conditions, about those conditions, displaying those conditions, but re recognizing one's position as a kind of inquiring subject working from a set of, of very particular conditions. And for this, for this shift, I've needed a vocabulary, right? The vocabulary that I inherited um, has not served me well, and so I've needed a vocabulary. So I've been trying to, to kind of, of develop um, a set of, 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 of concepts, and uh, maybe central to these is the notion of permissions and the notion of starting in the middle. And so I'll, I'll focus on, on those particular. Now, the notion of permissions is the very essence of the work, because the notions of permissions is not something that you are given. You're not given permission to work in this way or that way. You have to struggle for permission. And the, the struggle for permission is the one that allows the conditions from which you're working to somehow set up some kind of an exchange of, of an informed or, or a communicative exchange with the protocols of knowledge. And the the and this this is 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 very uh, to me this is is sort of very very important and um, I I last year I set up um, we have a, a weekly lecture series uh, at Goldsmith in our department and we curated by turns different people in the department and last year I curated. Um, the, the trimester on the notion of permissions. And I decided to invite only our former students, right? No colleagues, no famous names, only our former students who had graduated, developed some kind of a practice, and I wanted to see what was going on. And what was so interesting was that the knowledge that they had acquired while working in the department um, or working against the department or whatever it was that they were doing there um, did not take the form of any kind of continuation. So I thought a pedagogical model that actually allows people to not refute, which is, let's say, as, as a sort of, of a young intellectual emerging from art history and not wanting to do art history, I contested art history. I remember uh, Clive Dillnott, with whom I had a writing partnership at a certain point, saying, look at you, every time we sit down to write a text, you start by flailing your fists at art history. You have something to say, say it. You know, why do you have to preface everything with the negation of a body of inherited knowledges? And um, wise words, but then they took about 20 years to actually sort of, of, of actualize in some kind of form of working. And so the, the important thing to me was about all of these projects that all of these people who had um, been in, in the department um, were doing was they didn't reference back at all, right? They, they sort of, of said what we really got was the ability to find an entry point, a new entry point into a question. That was really the point of our education. And I have to say it made me very happy. Um, so permissions have to do with what it means to 
produce an interface between existing bodies of knowledge, the conditions which you're living out, and the sense that you have which is that you can start from elsewhere, that you can always start from elsewhere. And I think the permission is the notion of starting from elsewhere, which is, is um, sort of, of very much the legacy of Derridean deconstruction, the notion that not that, not here, not in this way, rather than the, the sort of, of oppositional mode of a particular set of assertions. Um, starting from the middle is the sort of possibility, and I'll, I'll go into it in a bit more detail. Can somebody tell me when I have five minutes more? Thanks. Um, the starting in the middle has to do with the sort of possibility of not rehearsing the entire narrative as we have received it, of finding um, an, a kind of entry point that has the permission to start from right now. And um, here, it, the most fundamental thing is the narrative structures by which knowledge is circulating are changing fundamentally. And so if what we've her inherited is the ability to produce a kind of teleological argument that starts somewhere, has a kind of, of middle ground and, and proceeds from there, the, the, the sort of degree to which uh, computational logics, algorithmic operations, the, the sort of, of, of fractal thinking, have affected the entire narrative of, of knowledge, the way in which one gives account to a body of knowledge, means that the, the sort of old model of telling a, a linear story, a story that develops a long time, is virtually impossible. And this, this is one of the reasons I'm trying to think so much about what it is to be a viewer of research, because you're suspended between two, two sets of narrative possibilities. One of them is storytelling as we know it, and the other is a whole set of fragmentations in which knowledge gets put together in, in different ways according to the question that is posed or the way in which a, a sort of bodies of information are filtered and, and selected. And as a result, as I look at very kind of contemporary experiments with artwork that is also a mode of not knowledge production, but of, of putting together different bits of knowledge, I realize that actually what is on the table is the very question of knowability. Because the, the sort of knowledge has always been served to us within some kind of a narrative. And when that narrative is no longer operational, what are the conditions of knowability that we have? When we have an account of something that is made up of, let's say, Nordic myths and, and fractal physics and certain kind of computational knowledges and certain amount of, of, of marine biology, and all of this comes together into an account, but it's not an account that could be read from any of those sources. It's about the, the sort of, of interrelations and interruptions that those produce within one another, and those interrelations and interruptions do a great deal of work. They don't allow the dominance of one single economy over the narrative. Um, so if, if one is thinking about the, the sort of, of emergent economies of, 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 of the sea and marine life, one is thinking about economies of oil, when they are subjected to six or seven different logics by which one is informed about their different components, they cannot be captive within one economy. And that is, within neoliberal climates, a tremendously important uh, political act. So starting in the middle is really the, the sort of, of, of possibility of thinking knowledge production through um, 
modes of, of, of giving account that are fundamentally at odds and do not, are not subsumed by the same logic. Um, so, but knowledge is always situated. You know, anybody who's, who's followed feminist epistemology in the 1980s, um, I think has to hand a very convincing case of the degree to which knowledge is, is situated. For, so for whom is this uh, shift that I'm describing? Partly for academics, mired in endless lineages of knowledge. Starting in the middle <coughs> means not having to rehearse the telos of, expo of, of a concept. For practitioners of various forms and languages, starting in the middle means the inventing of external referencing, not context and not content. So the, the sort of, of um, and, and the, the sort of argument against knowledge getting its meaning, uh, not from its context, is, is very much a, a logic that follows um, the arguments of Deleuze, um, where knowledge is, is sort of performative and one encounters it through a series of effects, <coughs> not through a series of contextual histories. Okay, I, I want to slightly mix it up, um, and so two bits. There is a postcard of a work by Gabriela Rothko that has been sitting on my desk for nearly a decade now. It shows a puddle in the street in Paris. At the edges of the puddle, several lines made by bicycle wheels can be seen. The bikes have ridden through the puddle and left tire marks on exiting in different directions. The image is iconic for me. It somehow captures how I would like to work, and that is why it has sat on my desk as a reminder for so very long. Something happened, something minor, with no great significance in the world. It cannot be recaptured, and it cannot be narrated back into some coherent story. We don't know who they were, and we don't know where they were going. But they were here, and they made their mark, and they somehow altered the site. Something happened, Deleuze has said. We can spend our time trying to trace it back into existing structures and modes of knowing, or we can move forward with its effects. I choose the latter, starting in the middle, not explaining, not letting puzzlement produce empirical questions, thinking that rather than tell the story of the bicyclists, I might just take up their journey. I have at this moment many permissions of how I might work, but they are not a menu from which to order. At present, we have the possibility of working in ways, inventive and experimental, that critically embody the critical insights of the past 40 years of the project of critique. So one of the things that um, I am, am, for me, are really, really important is that all of this could not have taken place without the immense project of critique and the destabilization of knowledge that it produced over the last 40 years. So the, the sort of, it, I, I cannot hang all of this on kind of technical, um, in technological invention. It seems to me that if this is going to be a project that actually produces the kind of fundamental sea change in the production of knowledge that I think it is producing, then it also has to be linked, but in a tangential way, to the, the sort of, not necessarily this author, that author, that this orthodoxy, this body of thought, that lineage, but to the kind of earthquake that, um, that, that the, the sort of project of critique served and what became possible in its aftermath. What became possible is in its aftermath. The subject cannot be defined. The sign cannot be stabilized. We ask not what something is, but what it makes possible. 
we recognize difference as an internal dynamic rather than as an embodied identity. We gather as singularities rather than as identities. And we invent our politics rather than fight over their meager remains. Rather than digging for hidden knowledge, we recognize the secret in full light. And rather than fit in with designated readerships, we constitute new audiences. That is the way we work now. Moving beyond factual analysis, quantitative measuring, contextual historicizing and theorizing, we have permission to engage in fictionalizing, docudramatizing, bureaucratic mimicry, fractalization of the material world, in the invention of subjects and of archives. And not only do we have the possibility of producing these conceptual revisions, but we can also inhabit these in a variety of performative affects. We can be serious or be hilarious or be seductive or be delirious or be confused or be severe. Perhaps most importantly, we have permissions to constitute new subjects from the detritus lying at the edges of previous subjects new subjects that we arrive at through circuitous paths, new subjects that cannot be captured so easily by the regimes of discipline or expertise of clearly defined fields. The constitution of a new subject is not a fresh or daring take on an old subject. Sorry, I just invented something that sounds like old subjects to me here, so don't take this too seriously, right? The war on Iraq is an old sub subject. The supply lines of natural resources is an old subject. The polyphonic urban environment is an old subject in the sense that they're, they're made up of an existing menu of conjunctions. These are subjects in the world, in reality, and much of what we see in academic creative work are fresh insights, new entry points into already constituted subjects, but they are not the constitution of new subjects. And of course, a new subject will generate new archives from which to read it. It will bring in new actors who can play a part in it. In fact, it will do everything but enact the protocols of representation. So one of the things that, again, is in a way the legacy of, of the project of critique is the degree to which we're not operating in the arena of representation any longer. Right? So the, the idea of a subject that is constituted in order to represent a series of questions that are already existing in the world is really not the arena in which new knowledge is operating. At the moment in which we have a clear idea of what the subject is, we have already lost the attempt to constitute it, for it needs to constitute us if it is to take place in the world. At this moment in post-representational knowledge production or curating, it is politically imperative that we constitute new subjects. Since 2007, uh, we have lived out the bankruptcy of, all, of the old subjects, but have yet to make the bold step of inventing new ones rather than taking up positions around old ones. We have been externalizing our wrath against the banks and the, financial, the global financial network rather than understanding that we are now many banking instances, plotting out the course of our lives through moments of self-investment and share flotation many instances in which human capital is our only self-definition. And so each time we galvanize to put forward one of these efforts at producing new subjects or at working by inventing a protocol for the work, we affect an act of unbelonging. And we take the risk associated with such a departure. We unbelong ourselves from the designated sites and methodologies of knowledge and its protocols. We also unbelong ourselves from having a position. And we risk the loss of familiar affiliations of known navigational paths. Harney and Moton in the undercommons speak of fugitive study, an internal digression that undermines knowledge or practice from within, 
but without making such claims. So fugitive study becomes an integral, internal part of what it is to study rather than an external opposition against what is studied or how it is studied. Okay, I've more or less run out of time, so I am going to... How do I, how do I move this up and down? It, can you get me to slide number one? Yeah, of course. You, you want to start at the beginning? Yeah. That's you the can diagram move. is the beginning. Ah, okay. That's it. You okay. can move up and down here. Right. In, I'm now going to, in five minutes, race through two and a half years of work by a vast group of people just to give you an idea of a way of working, not the ideal work, way of working, not the paradigmatic way of working, but a way of working. I belong to a collective called Free Thought. Free Thought is myself, Stefano Harney, Adrian Heathfield, Massimiliano Molona, uh, Luis Moreno and Nora Sternfeld um, were from various kind of, of um, different different areas of work. We're all academics in one way or another, and we all all of us work in f different forms of public education, public organizing, curating, etc. Um, we were invited to be uh, the co-directors of the Bergen Assembly, which is the Norwegian Triennial, and. This is what we applied with. Now, this is only important in the sense that, uh, I mean, Bergen is a very particular situation. It's a new triennial. This was only its second uh, iteration. And it's very much a research uh, project. It's not an exhibition project. It's not interest in spectacles. Uh, they brought in uh, ourselves and Tarek Atwi, um, Paris-based Lebanese uh, composer an instrument maker and um, praxis. Um, so the, the sort of point about this was that this was very much thought of as all the different forms that the project of infrastructure uh, might take as an investigation. Uh, we taught a public seminar, a city seminar in Bergen for over two years using the public library and all the civic institutions of the city um, to try and kind of, of actualize that dimension of public culture. Uh, we, we threw us a, a dinner for the whole city uh, after each one of these seminars and invited a lecturer who could kind of open up the arena for a slightly um, in, in a slightly more, more um, transferable mode. Um, and the, the sort of, of um, developed an online practice, opened a cafe, which is based on the Partisan Coffee House, which was um, a left-wing uh, experiment in London between 1959 and 1963. Um, we put together a summit, which was our opening, which was actually a performance piece written by Adrian Heathfield, performed by all of us, and um, a, a bunch of people that we brought in. Um, the exhibition is what we call public displays, and I'll show you bits of the exhibition. Um, and we're at the moment producing a book called The Infrastructural Condition. Now, I don't have time to go into why infrastructure, but maybe this audience doesn't need to be told why infrastructure. Perhaps the infrastructural condition is something that everyone here knows we are living out and that we're governed not by ideologies, uh, but by infrastructures that um, designate uh, spaces, discipline bodies, produce protocols, um, and, and make possible mobilities and, and permissions. So, this thing that seems to have cut off at, at um, this is the, the old Bergen fire station, uh, now occupied by the retired firemen of Bergen who are the heroes of the city because they keep saving it from fire every five or six years. Um, they want to turn this into a museum of fire. The city wants to develop it into a hotel. The usual kind of gentrification argument has been unfolding. We decided to co-inhabit it together with the firemen. 
The firemen wanted a museum of fire. That's what they want. Um, and so we brought in Isa Rosenberger, an Austrian artist, and um, she, together with the testimonies and the archives of the firemen, produced something that we're calling the Museum of Burning Questions. So this is part of it. Um, my colleague, Massimiliano Molona, who's an anthropologist of labor, works in uh, heavy industry, um, did a, a documentary film on the end of oil. His project is called The End of Oil, What's Going to Happen to Norway at the End of Oil. He worked with the Electricians Union on the last rig that was being built uh, off, off the west coast of Norway. At the same time, oh, sorry, at, at the same time um, he commissioned Phil Collins uh, to make a, a sort of a, a film about the end of oil, and Phil Collins made a manga, um, he, a, a, a manga film, um, which is a kind of dystopian fable on what happens um, at the end of oil. The poor have to said, sell their blood and go into capsules that orbit the earth, etc., etc. Um, this is the Partisan Cafe. We hired a team of educators. This is the group um, that made, you know, Norway's very expensive, so a free cup of coffee or free anything is kind of a big deal. So um, we had a cafe, and they were there in order to develop conversations with visitors. So it became a kind of main hub of hanging out. Um, there were also, this is Charismatic Megafauna, a band of post-punk girl drummers. And um, this is the kind of event that took place in the cafe nightly. During the day, there were screenings, discussions, and just sort of one-to-one of -one conversations. Um, this is Infrastructures of Feeling, um, a sound piece by um, a, a, a kind of infrastructural machine uh, invented by Paul Pergus and Luis Moreno. Um, it's a machine that analyzes, it's three, actually it's, it's three sets um, of software programs that listen to Norwegian music, mine it for certain kind of emotive categories, translate those emotive categories into keywords, and translate the keywords into orders of books at um, in Amazon. So this is on day one, and by the time we left, there was a thousand books, which we gave to the public library. It makes absolutely no sense as a library, but that was the point of it. Um, this is the Partisan Coffee House. Um, this is a, a, the archive of a historian called Mike Berlin, who worked with us in order to kind of, of make live the Partisan Coffee House. This is a, one of the wonderful photographs from Roger Main's archive of the Partisan <coughs> Coffee House. Um, and this is again a series of, of different documents. Um, this is the Shiraz Persepolis archive that's been put together by Vali Mahluji, who's an uh, Iranian um, curator. This was a very, very odd um, uh, phenomenon. It lasted for uh, 10 years, from 63 to 73, under the patronage of the Empress uh, of Persia, Faradiba, run by 10 radical international Marxist intellectuals. The, the, it made absolutely no sense, but um, through the patronage system, they managed to get um, both the international avant-garde to Shiraz, as well as, by being very canny about it, the, the sort of, of cultural production of the decolonizing world from um, Africa, from Latin America, from the Caribbean, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a kind of very odd encounter between these two. Um, this is um, 180. There's, everything that you see here is fake because the, the first fatwa issued by Ayatollah Khomeini uh, even before leaving Paris for Tehran was uh, a fatwa against Shiraz Persepolis Festival. So every shred of it was destroyed. So what Vali has done is he's out of bits of photographs somewhere, he's digitally reinvented the entire archive. This is the only original thing left, and it's an 180 hour durational performance that was filmed and is sitting in an archive in Paris. 
Um, this is an archive that I'm making, which is called an anecdoted archive of exhibition lives. It's um, interviews with um, sort of, of intellectuals, artists, curators um, from all over the world about moments in which an exhibition was a transformative experience for their consciousness. Um, and we are sort of at, at the moment at about 20 interviews. Um, you see Kader Atia, Elvira Dyangyani Ose, and Yvette Kuric. And um, this is very much about a kind of infrastructure of subjectivity that isn't grounded in canonical institutions, canonical exhibitions, canonical artists. Um, this is, this is uh, Bonaventure and Dikung, who uh, in a way, by his brilliant interview, defined our archive. Uh, this is an archive of the seminar that we taught, uh, every seminar with a description, a quote, etc. This is the, the sort of reading room, the collection of everything that we read uh, over the two and a half years. Um, and this is part of Stefano Harney's quite extraordinary project, Shipping in the Shipped, uh, for which he wrote a brilliant text and then um, started a whole series of conversations with artists who made work to try and think through the problematic that one cannot have an account of the logistics of shipping without having an account of those who were shipped and who made shipping the kind of global circulation that it became. Uh, There's sort of more, um, and this is Serpent Rain, Arjuna Neumann's film, which is part of the shipping of the ship. And which is, I was really talking about when I talked about new knowledge formations that bring together um, sort of fractality, marine biology, a series of, of, of um, metaphorical visual encounters, uh, different kinds of knowledges. It's, it's around the thinking of Denise de Ferra Silva, um, who kind of, of produced the bone structure for an argument about the implications of the the shipped globally, uh, and this is our this is our summit, um, the the opening, and you see Wu Zan, Fred, uh, Stefano Harney, uh, Hypatia Volumis, and Fred Moten. Uh, this is another image of um, the summit with uh, Elizabeth Povinelli. And that's it. So this, um, this isn't about an exhibition, because I, I don't think as an exhibition it's all that interesting. It's about a research project, and it's about how really um, the sort of, to use a slightly old-fashioned, Old Testament term, what it is to become legion. Because we're six. By the time our project came to fruition in Bergen, we were 52. And so this notion of bringing together knowledge as it becomes essential, not in advance, not a plot, we'll have this one and we'll have this artist and we'll have this, but as you work, you think, okay, this absolutely requires this kind of knowledge, this kind of intervention, this kind of language. And um, I, think, I think it was Nam Jun Paik who distributed his salary at the Dusseldorf Academy of Art uh, pr pr pro rata, percentage-wise, to anybody who would come to the seminar. He said, anybody who came to the seminar can have this percentage of my salary. The next day it was a smaller percentage, and so on and so on. But this is how we thought of our budget, as, as a kind of distributory mechanism by which we could feed the city and bring in anybody who had anything interesting to say. Thank you. Thank you.